Wednesday. You know what that means. Time for the Southern California Writers Association Hump Day Book Tour. I'm your host, Maddie Margarita, here with Diana Pardee on tech. Every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m., the Southern California Writers Association turns our Facebook page over to a new writer to talk about their books and their work. And this morning, we're pleased to welcome Lisa Morton. Lisa is a screenwriter, author of nonfiction books, and Bram Stoker award-winning prose writer, whose work has been described as consistently dark, unsettling, and frightening. A Halloween expert, she wrote the definitive reference book, The Halloween Encyclopedia, the multiple award-winning Trick or Treat, A History of Halloween. She's spoken about the holiday in the Wall Street Journal and the Boston Globe, on the BBC, the History Channel, and on other outlets. Uh, she's also supplied a uh, section on, Hallow of <laughs> on Halloween candy. I think I was just thinking about the Halloween candy. On the Oxford Companion to Sugar and Sweets, wrote the Halloween chapter for the Art of Horror, and served as consultant on the U.S. Postal's, Postal Office 2016-2019 Halloween stamps. Wow. Lisa, good morning. Hey, good morning, Maddie, and uh, thank you to everybody at SCWA for letting me come in here. Well, you know, it's not often we get to um, talk to a zombie expert. So, <laughs> you know, they, they don't usually come through here in, in busloads. So um, let's... I know you write about a lot of things, but let's talk about your recent, most recent project, um, the, your zombie book. Do you want to talk a little bit about the book and what makes it different from some of the other work that you've done? It is this book right here, which um, it's hard to see just how big this thing really is. It's uh, a, an illustrated coffee table art book, and I had never done one of those. I kind of always wanted to do it. It was kind of a bucket list item for me, and it was a very interesting experience. It took about a year. It was what most of my 2022 went to. Um, one of the things I didn't quite realize when I was brought into this project was that the author was responsible for both writing the text and coming up with the more than 500 illustrations. And um, that was uh, quite the learning experience, but it was actually really fun. Um, the publisher took some of the hardest part of it off of me because I had a picture editor whose job was to make sure copyright was clear and I had layout people and I had editors and all that so um, I kind of got just the fun part of it all and I'll just give everybody a quick glimpse at just how packed with illustrations this thing is um, it is 256 pages and we got a forward by John Russo who if people don't know that name he co-created Night of the Living Dead with George Romero in 1968 so he is a living legend it also has an afterword by a wonderful author named Daniel Krause. Oh well um, you know I, I think I, I'm always interested in why people are so fascinated with the, uh, not just a cult and, and what we would consider horror figures, but particularly the uh, characterization of individual uh, subgenres like zombies and werewolves and vampires and how we all have our own uh, views of what these characters are and what they represent. So I'm kind of curious to talk to you a little bit about zombies in particular. <laughs> Yeah, but sometimes I can't believe we get to have these conversations, which I love. But where do you think zombies in, as, a, as a scary uh, monster came from? Uh, and why do you think it's, it has such universal connection? Because it's not just here in the U.S. Um, it's a, they're a worldwide phenomenon. Yeah, they sure are. And uh, in fact, one of the things I tried to do in this book was cover zombie films all over the world, and they are everywhere. Um, and I, I think what they represent for us is our fear of conformity, our fear that we will die and be reduced to nothing but this walking, willless, mindless thing obsessed with consumption. Um, on the other side of the coin, they excite us because there's also the part played by the zombie hunter, who is somebody who has to be strong and resolute and very focused. And so that's the exciting part. But I think the fearful part is that fear that we will just be re reduced to one tiny part of a shambling, mindless horde. That's only on the weekends, though, um, that we that we assume that persona. So. 
uh, that aside from the beautiful book, uh, because in itself, that looks like a work of art um, and, and the pictures. And I, I know you were uh, talking about writing the text and the copy that uh, came together with those pictures and that that turned out to be a, a bigger project that you thought uh, initially. So I think that's one of the things when you see those coffee table books, you see lots of pictures and it's left for you to enjoy the pictures and interpret and um, enjoy it the way that you want, but you have taken it another step or added another step. And you wanna talk a little bit about um, what you included in that and where that came from. Yeah, I wanted to really dig into the history of zombies. So I didn't want it to just be a pretty picture book. I wanted it to actually explain where this all comes from and the historical background of it. Um, one of the interesting things that I found out was that zombies were kind of, I mean, they were known in certain travelogues, even from the 18th century, but they didn't become really a significant part of popular culture until 1929. And in 1929, there was a book put out by a, a, an author named William Seabrook, and the book was called The Magic Island. And Seabrook was a guy who wrote books based on his travels around the world. And he was obsessed with things like magic and occultism. He even was friends with Aleister Crowley, who was the great magician and so forth. Um, and so the Magic Island is about a year he lived in Haiti. And while he was living in Haiti, he learned a lot about voodoo. He got to know some of the locals. And chapter, I think it's chapter seven in the book, is completely dedicated to zombies. And it talks about how they were these um, uh, things that were resurrected from the grave by the voodoo bokurs, who are what we would call the witch doctors, that they were resurrected mainly to work as slave labor, that they were put into labor out in the, the sugar fields. And they actually, interestingly enough, in voodoo, um, traditional voodoo legend, they did require some sustenance but it had to be like a really boring gruel apparently the belief was that if they ever ate any salt or meat they would regain awareness and they would march right back to their graves um so this book was was a big bestseller in 29 it led almost immediately to a broadway play called zombie which did not do very well but in 1932, a movie came out called White Zombie, which did incredibly well. It starred Bella Lugosi, um, and it dealt with the whole idea of um, he plays the voodoo master in it, um, and he is resurrecting both his enemies just to sort of serve as his entourage, and he is also resurrecting laborers. And, and my favorite scene in the movie is a scene of a bunch of zombies who are grinding up something in a big mill and one of them falls into the, the gears of this massive mill and doesn't even react. It's it's just the idea that he's so mindless is that he can be ground up in a mill and not even notice was pretty horrific. I, I think, and we have talked about this a little bit before about the idea of monsters and why people love monsters, zombies, werewolves, uh, you know, vampires. Uh, what, what do you think is the attraction? What do you think is the ma almost magnetic, uh, compelling uh, draw of, of these creatures? Well, I think monsters represent both certain fears that we have. Um, the, like I said, I think the zombie is our fear of conformity, of being mindless and controlled. I think the werewolf, for example, is our fear of losing control, of being full of rage that we can't begin to rein in. Um, and I think these monsters, though, also represent the outsider, and, and we are both uh, afraid of outsiders and obsessed with them. And some of us feel like we are outsiders. And I mean, I was a pretty weird kid, no big surprise there. So I grew up loving the Universal Monsters. Those were those movies were running endlessly when I was a kid. And, and I would identify with them. And to me, the real horrors in something like Frankenstein was not the monster, but the people carrying torches and screaming for the monster's blood, you know, and um, so that's one of the things that I think we love about monsters too, is that again, that duality to them. 
the, the, and I think the best monsters have the most humanity yeah. uh, in them so that we, we see ourselves in that. And I really, I agree. I think that they're a projection of our fears um, and, you know, horror has always been, you know, a, an important part of literature and movies, but it has assumed a greater uh, importance or, uh, I don't know, it's, it's reaching a, a broader demographic, it seems, um, today and than, it, than it has in the past, and an acceptance of, of that. So do you have any thoughts on, on why now, why today that horror is more uh, popular than ever? Yeah, it, it definitely is. Um, some of us who are uh, part of the genre think it's almost in a golden age right now. It, you know, all genres go through cycles. Um, horror kind of fell in the 90s. There was a glut of bad horror in the 80s that led to a kind of decline in the 90s. And then there were some some not very good movies that came out about then that just kind of depended mainly on gore more than story or great characters. But now we are coming back big time. And one of the exciting things about the genre is the diversification of voices, of authors in the genre, of people telling the stories. Um, it's so exciting to see authors of color and LGBTQ plus authors and um, all coming in and, and making this genre their own and telling these incredible fresh new stories. And so I think that diversity is one of the reasons that horror is is becoming really big right now. So interesting. So it, you are a screenwriter. You write in a lot of different forms. Um, how do you decide what you're going to write next? At this point, I'm very fortunate to be able to say, yes, I have a writing career. And it, my career tends to be dedicated by what I need to make money from. <laughs> um, I My day job is a bookseller, and I love being a bookseller. I work at the Iliad Bookshop in North Hollywood. It's a dream job, but it also is not an incredibly high-paying job. I need writing income to live. So a lot of what I take on is dictated purely by oh, they offered me a really good deal on this. Um, and I was indeed a hired gun on this. I was, they had the idea, they brought me in. Um, and um, if I am doing the occasional time when I don't have an endless to-do list of things I owe people and I'm doing freelance stuff, then I will do a little bit of uh, market research and see what looks good and what's paying well. And um, so, yeah, unfortunately, I'm not always free to write whatever I want. So, and, and you do a mix of fiction and nonfiction. So right. when, when you have those rare moments that you can freelance, what do you write? I write short fiction. I love short fiction. It's my, my favorite preferred form. Um, I write mainly in horror, but I have dabbled a little bit in mystery. Um, mystery is one of those things I always think maybe I should get more into because um, three years ago I had a story chosen for Best American Mystery Stories 2020, which still floors me. I don't know how that happened, but yeah, so um, just essentially I love telling short stories. I'm actually up to almost 200 published short stories now. So is there such thing as a Lisa Morton short story? I mean, are there earmarks to your work or themes that thematically uh, are they related or characters or are there things that you think are really your trademark in your writing? It's funny because a couple of years ago I was asked to do a story for the um, uh, Resurrection of Weird Tales which of course is a legendary magazine that goes back to the 20s and um, the new editor is my friend Jonathan Mayberry, and I said to Jonathan, what kind of story do you want? And he said to me, a Lisa Morton story, and I'm not sure I know what that is. I'm not, I have been told I have a very distinctive style and things that I approach. I'm not completely aware about of what that all is. I do know that I love to write about women, um, and that, again, is something I feel like was ignored for far too long in the horror genre, women tended to be the victims and not the protagonists. 
Um, so I love to explore women. I love to explore all kinds of different people in my fiction. And, and I'm also not averse to occasionally dealing with current topics in my fiction, which is something that I know a lot of horror writers have this, oh, no, I can't get political or social or something. And I, I absolutely think you can if you do it really well. And I love to, to talk about things that concern me in my fiction. I think and uh, horror is a safe way to explore social issues, mm -hmm. safer way because there's enough distance and um, un unreality, is that the word? Um, into it that people uh, don't necessarily see the correlation right away to what's happening. You know, I, I love those stories where you get maybe a quarter of the way through and you're like, oh, I see where, I see where it's happening here. You know, and and I'm on board, and I think you know that there's a, there's a subtlety to exploring those issues in that genre um, that that feels safe to yeah. people reading it. That doesn't necessarily feel like you're preaching or or trying to convince people or whatever, but it, letting people come to their own conclusions based on situations and characters, which is just like real life. And I'm also not afraid, though, to make my opinion known. Um, one of my most reprinted short stories is a zombie story, of all things, called Sparks Fly Upward. And it is about a post-apocalypse setting, a community that is doing very well, that is surviving the zombie apocalypse. But they do that by very carefully monitoring their supplies and their population and so forth and people are not allowed to have masses of children because that would delete their resources too quickly and it's so it's told from the point of view of a woman who is pregnant who has agreed to have an abortion to keep the community safe and so that was a way that I dealt with my feelings on abortion. And um, it obviously resonated with some people, both because it has been reprinted many times and because I actually got some hate mail from it, which <laughs> I, <laughs> yeah, told me I was doing something right. Well, I guess, I guess trying to provoke emotion and, and a response uh, to a writer, that's a badge of honor uh, in, in a lot of cases. So um, what are you working on now? I am catching up. Um, right now, I'm trying to stay sane in October. As a Halloween expert, it is my busiest month of the year, and it's just endless interviews and presentations and lectures and signings. And I'm not complaining, but it's tiring. Um, so after October 31st, there are a few short stories that I owe someone um, that I will get caught up on. And then I'm hoping that there will be some good news from my agent. So right now he is shopping a couple of things for me. We'll wait and see if any of those click the way that I'm hoping one of them will. Well, we will keep our fingers crossed for you. Uh, where can people find your books and um, talk, can you just talk briefly about your website, uh, which uh, we talked about and if anybody has an hour or two, uh, go, go to Lisa Morton's website. I, I like to make free readings and so forth there. It's uh, very easy. LisaMorton.com is a good place to start. Um, from there, you can find links to my social media and my books for sale. And um, even you will even see a link there to the Atlas Obscura course I am teaching on the history of Halloween. Yeah, you may be the only Halloween historian I have ever met. So yes, yeah, so we're excited um, for the new book. I think it's, it's beautiful. Uh, it, as beautiful as zombies can be, as right. dripping flesh uh, can be, but it's it's also interesting. And if anybody has uh, friends or family that are interested, what a great gift um, that would be. So if you can do that, that's fine. If you just want to find out more about Lisa, please go to her website. Um, thank you for being here, Lisa. Uh, we appreciate it. And everybody, thank you for joining us this morning. Um, on the Southern California Associate Writers Association Hump Day Book Tour. Uh, you can find uh, Lisa's interview. You can share this interview on Facebook, or you can go to SCWA Writers Online and find a packaged version of this interview, as well as over 150 other interviews. So we appreciate uh, everybody being here. And until next week, please stay safe and keep reading. Bye. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you. Happy Halloween, everyone.